Hello and welcome to Management 312, Introduction to Project Management. I am your professor, Dr. Craig Winstead. Uh, and we're just going to go over the first module here to get you acquainted with the basic principles of project management and hopefully get you underway on your foundation in the project management area. Uh, just as a course overview before we get into today's lecture, uh, what we'll see throughout this entire course is we'll build upon the foundations moving towards team projects uh, that you'll all participate in. So the first week we talk about the kind of what and why of project management uh, and that's what I'll get into in this particular lecture. Uh, in week two we talk about constructing a project team uh, project initiation. I'm switching it up a little bit uh, where we'll actually get in teams by week three and have you doing team assignments, but some of your reading will relate to this. Uh, in the third week, we'll talk about project planning, uh, the whole nuts and bolts of the planning process, which is probably one of the more involved processes within the whole project management realm. Uh, we'll continue with that through week four. In week four, of course, you know, you have your midterm. Uh, week five, we'll uh, talk about, you know, we'll, we'll do a little bit of reviewing, actually, and evaluating. And actually, that's when you'll have your, your midterm. Uh, sometimes I'll do it in week four. Sometimes I'll do it in week five. But it, usually, yeah, I'll do it in week five, depending on how the term is going. Uh, in week six, though, we'll talk about scheduling techniques, which is uh, quite important to project managers. Uh, then we'll talk about project monitoring and control and that's when you'll actually be turning in your final project plan and I haven't even told you about the project plan yet don't worry about it just yet uh, when we start talking about your final assignment and we start talking about team assignments you'll understand where we're going with that uh, and then in week eight I do another review kind of see where we are and we'll do a final exam in week eight all right. So this course in general, hopefully you've all had a chance to read the syllabus by now. And again, if you have any questions, uh, just email me questions on the syllabus. Uh, but basically the way the course is designed, we look at project management from both a qualitative and a quantitative perspective. Uh, aspect so you know it defines a project and you know assist project managers by applying the knowledge skills tools and techniques uh, from a qualitative standpoint we'll look at things like human behavior we'll look at organizational knowledge we'll look at negotiation techniques uh, that type of thing uh, contracting uh, in, anything that actually has to do with dealing with people dealing with your teammates team members uh, that's kind of the qualitative side of it and then the quantitative side we actually learn some tools that you can use to monitor your project as it moves along so that's you know anything like what's mentioned here that you probably have no idea some of you may have seen this before have used it but we'll learn things like PERT uh, which is program evaluation review techniques uh, mainly it's a diagramming technique but it's also an estimating technique for time uh, we'll use critical path method. You'll learn all about that later. So if none of this sounds familiar, don't worry about it. And we'll talk about uh, budgeting, cost estimation, all that good stuff. So in that project that you will all participate in, we will be touching on all those things and you'll get a chance to actually perform them. So let's begin with the you know, most simple is or the, the most simple foundation for what is a project. What is the actual definition of a project? So the official definition uh, from the Project Management Institute, which is the largest professional organization for project managers, it's over 600,000 members, and actually you'll be doing an assignment on it, so you'll see more information about it. Uh, but uh, they define a project as a temporary endeavor undertaken to create a unique product, service, or result. Uh, and the reason I highlighted temporary or I put it in bold is because for any project you have a defined beginning and a defined end. So that's the first thing that makes it a project. Uh, so it has a defined beginning and a defined end that you're planning out. 
Of course, it doesn't always stick to that exact time frame, but that is the plan going in. Uh, it also should be unique in that it is not business as usual. And what I mean by that is if your normal business is to, you know, make some type of widgets uh, and that's what you do day in, day out, that's not project work. That's your daily activities. Uh, but if you do something that's going to be temporary in nature, say you're going to redesign the factory where you make those widgets uh, and get some new machinery in and you have a whole plan on, you know, when it should be installed and when, when we'll be using it by, uh, that's considered a project. It's something out of the ordinary, has defined beginning, defined end. It's unique. It's outside of business as usual. So you can use that term as well. You'll hear that sometimes business as usual, B-A-U for short. Uh, but projects should be outside of that, the stuff you normally do. Uh, now projects can create or improve products. Uh, they can create a service or they can spawn events or produce information. So some projects are just kind of like research projects where we just want to find out some information. Uh, other ones, maybe we're making the brand new iPhone or something and you know that's a new product that we're going to make to compete in the market, you know, some other phone that's going to compete with iPhone, let's say. Um, so your products are used in pretty much every industry nowadays. Uh, everything, you know, it's heavy in, of course, software development, IT, uh, information systems, it's heavy in construction, but it's also in things like entertainment, they use it in the film industry, music industry. Uh, concert touring, that type of stuff. Uh, it, it's pretty much used across the board. Government agencies uh, pretty much use projects for all kinds of work. A lot of industries now, if they're going to go in a new direction, say create a new product or say if it's a, a on-ground business that wants to go online, they're first going to try that as a project as opposed to going all in, you know, right up front. Uh, so again, all types of organizations uh, engage in project activities and you know, you can think to yourself of any examples that would fit this definition. So when you think about a project, just think of something that was temporary, that's unique. Uh, and I should also mention that you always want to complete your projects on time, within budget, and within scope. And we'll talk about all three of those. So we have a definition of the project now. Now let's give you the definition of project management. And that is the application of the knowledge, skills, and techniques to execute projects effectively and efficiently. Uh, so like it says here, you should always want to tie your project to business goals. Otherwise, why would you be doing it? So anytime the organizations sit down and decide, you know, whether they're going to go into a project, uh, to, and typically they're going to do this for various reasons. It could be this: there's an opportunity out there. Maybe there's an opportunity in the market to be first in the market or something with some new product, uh, or they need to fix something that's wrong. Uh, maybe you know uh, there's an organization where workers are getting injured on the job often in a certain part of the organization. Uh, and maybe there's a project to go in and find out why and another project might be you know how we're going to you know, conduct training or how we're going to fix the situation do we need new equipment in here do we need to train on different activities that type of thing uh, but and the other the third reason I should say is that it could also just be a mandate sometimes the government or a regulatory body mandates that you know a project go into effect uh, one that comes to mind real quick is you know the year 2000 when everybody had to update their computers uh, that was just a mandate otherwise you were going to have trouble uh, another one is if anyone's familiar with Sarbanes-Oxley uh, for the accounting industry where they had to be more for forthright with their information they had to be more transparent it was a government required activity for a lot of firms to update their systems uh, because of places like Enron and Arthur Anderson uh, who made that you know an issue. Um, another question you can ask yourself is if you ever heard of the PMBOK or PMBOK that's that PMBOK if you have it don't feel bad but it stands for Project Management Body of Knowledge. 
Uh, and again, that's from the Project Management Institute. They come out with a book every few years. It's actually a guide, a standard uh, that most project managers follow. There are other standards and it's just suggested guidelines that they have, but it's probably the most widely known and, and, and widely used system for managing projects. So uh, the Project Management Body of Knowledge refers to that guide that's put out by the Project Management Institute. So if you hear PMBOK or PMBOK, it's all referring to that same thing. All right, so what is the role of the project manager? Well, project manager one plans the project. So they figure out you know, how we're going to get from A to Z within the project. So if I'm creating a new product again, for example, uh, we start with what are the requirements going to be and what's, you know, what do we need for this product? Uh, what does the customer require, et cetera, et cetera, all the way to the handing off that product uh, to the customer. Uh, they also develop and manage a project team. No project can be completed without a team. So you can have the best plan in the world, you can have all the resources in the world, but without the proper project management team in place, you're not going to have a successful project. So they always involve teams. That's another part of projects. A lot of people will get it mixed up and they think, uh, well, then, you know, maybe if I, you know, did a personal project, uh, you know, I redid my, my back deck last week. Well, that could be a project if indeed it included a team and, you know, you had a plan and again, you, it was, uh, something unique that you were doing which it probably would be uh, but you're planning it out you're working with team members uh, etc uh, so it's not a loan type thing projects are always completed with teams often with teams of people who don't normally work together by the way so a lot of times you're bringing together all kinds of different departments who are then gonna you know work together on this temporary endeavor to get it done so you might have people from marketing you might have people from construction or you know even breaking it down even further you might have people from electrical and engineering that type of thing uh, and all these people have to somehow work together and the one person in the center of it all is the project manager who has to be able to speak the language of all the different departments and work as a liaison between them and as a motivator to get the project completed. Uh, a project manager also has to monitor and control the project. So once it's underway, uh, how, how's it going? You always have to be checking in, especially from a budgetary standpoint, from a time standpoint, and from a scope standpoint. And just to give you a little preview on scope, scope means how large or how small the project is supposed to be or it can mean how simple to complex the project is. So going back to the example, if I'm creating the newest phone that's going to compete with the iPhone out there, is this phone going to have just a few of the same uh, widgets, tools, applications that the iPhone has? Or are we going to go much further than that make it a much more complex, you know, with the 4K camera and whatever else? So that's, that's what the scope entails, how simple or complex or how large or how small. If we're talking construction, or are you uh, going to, you know, maybe revamp two offices or 15 offices? Uh, that's an example of scope. That's going to change. Of course, you know, the 15 offices is going to take longer and cost more money, right? All right. And then we also have uh, the issues of closing the project. You have to bring it to an end. And usually that involves some type of inspection or handoff to the customer where they check off this list and say yes this has all been met everybody can now get paid uh, you know we turn in and we submit all of our documentation we keep that for so many years as project managers in case we run into a similar project and for legal reasons a lot of times you'll keep a lot of documentation so there are a lot of moving parts to a project that you know you figure out in the beginning that you have to close out in the end it could also mean you know if you worked on some type of environmental pro project where you making sure you you know the proper waste is handled you know there's not environmental waste laying around or it could also it could mean that uh you know you have to figure out how you're going to use some structure after the fact after the project's over a great example of that is uh, the Olympics. The Olympics are temporary. It's a huge project, but a lot of times they have things that are left over that then have to have a second life. 
for example, all of the housing for the athletes or, uh, you know, if they built a, a gigantic swimming pool, aquatic center, uh, what are they going to do with it in that city after the Olympics are over? So sometimes projects also involve planning and closing out and moving into that next phase where you won't be involved with that necessarily, but you planned it and you kind of hand it off and somebody else will be taking over that next phase. Some property manager will be handling all those apartments and renting them out, etc. Uh, there's also a couple other definitions that I just want you to know up front, throwing out a lot of definitions, but this kind of helps to build the foundation as we move forward. Uh, the first one is called a program. Uh, like I said, sometimes used to describe an effort that includes several uh, sub-projects. The thing to know about programs, and that is correct, if, if you have programs and there's something called a program manager, then that would be running those usually. Uh, it's just several you know smaller projects that are probably making up one big project they're all related in some way uh, so I get a lot of students who work at the shipyard and they talk a lot about how you know there are several different divisions that are say doing something on uh, one of those huge uh, either nuclear submarines or one of the ships uh, and there's a you know different divisions that are doing different work that kind of have their own mini projects to get done within say a two year time frame but the overall effort is the total uh, rehabbing or refurbishing of one of those ships uh, so that is a good example of a program where you're managing a bunch of smaller projects that kind of relate to each other a project portfolio on the other hand and people sometimes get this wrong is just a total set of projects that an organization has going on at any given time so if I'm a large corporation uh, and you know I have a hundred projects going on that's my project portfolio you know some of them may relate some of them may not relate to each other all of them should be helping to lead towards the organizational goals but they don't necessarily, you know, relate to each other or have to, you know, borrow resources from each other, that type of thing. A lot of times with programs, you are kind of fighting for resources and borrowing from resources because it's leading towards the same thing. And a lot of times it's the same program manager just running that. Okay. But again, everything should reflect strategic priorities of the organization. I can't overemphasize that enough uh, because uh, what happens is a lot of these organizations lose sight of that. And once they do, that's where they go down, you know, the rabbit hole, as they say, sometimes where you lose a lot of money uh, on projects that you necessarily, you know, that you didn't necessarily need in the first place. All right, so there's certain factors, and this your book will tell you this uh, when you're reading in, in the first couple chapters, uh, but certain factors that are increasing project activity uh, in this current time. Um, Basically, the first one is increased global competition. This should come at no surprise, as no surprise, uh, you know, with the advent of the internet and ever since, pretty much, you know, with e business and e commerce, uh, everything is kind of global now and has a global outlook with a lot of multinational companies putting their headquarters overseas, etc. Uh, there's global competition so it's no longer just you know you're competing against mom and pops especially once you're online you are pretty much competing with anyone out there who's in that same space so this increased global competition has created uh, the avenue for many more projects because there's a lot of things to explore out there that people do as projects first um, shorter product life cycle is similar if you notice there's a new iPhone or a new whatever the hot phone is you know Samsung Galaxy every what six months or something like that uh, you can't keep the same TV for more than six months to a year before something new comes out uh, you know now we're on 4k who, kno who knows what, you know what's coming up next uh, so <clears throat> shorter product life cycle is a is a big thing in you know many different industries uh, cars don't last as long some of these newer cars that type of thing so uh, or people buy them more often and so this just puts new projects out there and the other thing is uh, pressure to adapt to rapidly evolving technologies and that's all kind of related as well I mean technology is moving at you know great speeds 
supposedly by 2025 everybody will have a robot in their house so we'll see where technology is going and again uh, projects are falling right along with that so that's actually good news for those of you who really want to try to get into project management it looks like the industry is going to keep growing and actually I think if you look on the PMI's website it'll tell you the current stats but the last I saw I think there was something like 2.9 million jobs that still need to be filled uh, over like the next 10 years in project management uh, so and many of them are in the US but many of them are abroad as well so how do we measure the success of a project in general and this is a term that everyone should be familiar with uh, definitely by the end of the class but as soon as possible it's called the triple constraint on any project you are up against at least these three constraints and that is the constraint of time right because we have a specified beginning and end time we got six months to do this project or six weeks or two weeks whatever it is that is our time frame uh, we have costs right you only have so much money so you have a budget that's attached to your project uh, typically you also have a small contingency budget for if and when things go wrong or you know risk arise uh, typically that's between 10 to 25 percent of your overall budget depending on the size of the project and the complexity of the project and the length of time uh, and then you have what's called performance uh, more often though you'll see instead of performance you'll see scope but performance kind of relates to also not only the scope but it includes the quality so if you're you know really concerned with the quality of a, of a product uh, you're going to put that in there and the quality of the work that's being performed and the rate that the work has been performed is all part of that performance but the more traditional way you'll see this and this is why I put it at the bottom of the slide is you'll see the triple constraint either as time cost and scope that's the most often way you see it or you'll see the schedule budget and scope it's all the same thing but the whole point of this concept is whenever you make a change to one it is highly likely that the other two will be affected so for example if you know originally again I have a project that's going to take six months to do and maybe it's going to cost fifty thousand dollars and let's say the scope of it is I am going to uh, rehab uh, two offices let's say uh, if I change that time period suddenly from six months to six weeks that's gonna you know first of all have a heavy change on the cost of the project because anytime you shorten a project after you've already budgeted it out and you know what the costs are you know pretty much from an expert level you use experts you look you know looked at previous analysis you're looking at current prices that type of thing uh, so if you budget especially from the ground up uh, and you knew that cost was uh, fifty thousand dollars but and but you, it, you knew it was going to take six months now you have to do it six weeks it's going to cost you a heck of a lot more to get it done uh, it also may affect how much you can get done can we do both offices in six weeks as opposed to you know six months uh, we might be only be able to only do one office in that time uh, so again and these are interchangeable if we do the same thing if we say okay I want uh, 15 offices done instead of two well obviously that's going to add more time and that's going to add more cost or if you say I'm going to cut your budget in half so instead of fifty thousand you have twenty five thousand dollars well again now you have some serious choices to make it's going to affect your time potentially you know you can't pay as much uh, especially no overtime you're not getting anything done any extra quickly or anything like that uh, but also you may not be able to again get two offices done with the twenty five thousand when it's supposed to be fifty thousand dollars so the point is again with the triple constraint when you change one of those uh, it's going to affect the other two most likely all right so projects are typically set up in five phases and these are general phases um, just kind of suggested by the project management institute after analyzing researching thousands and thousands of projects this is not the way you'll see projects laid out every time by any means the thing about project management is it depends on the actual organization it depends on the industry how these projects are laid out but five general phases usually apply and they may just have different names or they get 
even more detail but the five general phases or the selection phase and that's where we're actually just deciding as a company as an organization which projects to work on I should let you know that project managers are not typically in this or involved in this process so in the selection process typically it's the sponsor and that's the person who actually has the purse strings the one who controls the budget is bringing the money to the table sometimes that can be the customer an outside customer or that could be your internal you know higher up uh, some type of uh, executive uh, and then maybe the project management office and we'll talk about that later sometimes there's a project management office that kind of oversees resources uh, they may be involved in that selection process as well but again the selection is going to come down to does it fit into the strategic directives of the company uh, and we're going to figure out which one is the best sometimes you have two or three ways you can go with the project or you got two or three different projects you can choose to work on and you have to prioritize and figure which one you're going to go with at that time so selection is the first phase once a project is selected then it is initiated typically initiation involves creating what's called a project charter which is basically like the blueprint for the uh, project uh, it's also basically the contract you know it's the green light to go ahead with the project usually before you get to a full charter what happens is someone in the organization will build what's called a business case which basically is almost like a mini business plan where it actually lays out exactly what we're trying to accomplish with the project you know what is it what deliverable we want to create that's what it's called that final thing that you create the product service or result is called a deliverable so uh, they decide you know what the deliverables deliverable is going to be uh, and again they'll decide on which project they're going with and all that stuff and then they uh, we'll have some original team meetings, a kickoff meeting, uh, and they'll actually get the project going. Uh, once the project is gone, you have that feel-good meeting, and typically kickoff meetings are fun, and you try to get the energy up, that type of thing. Uh, you actually start getting the work. So you go into the planning phase where you really lay out how we're going to get from A to Z again. Uh, so we have all kinds of planning documents that you can fill out that you'll get to see later and this is where you'll spend most of this class in in that planning phase we'll actually go through the steps on planning a, a project uh, and then you know we won't get to do this in this class but typically after you have planned a project then you actually need to do the work so, that, so that's the delivery and control part of it uh, if anyone has ever watched The Apprentice with Donald Trump uh, they give really good examples actually of many projects uh, where you know they get an assignment uh, they know what the deliverable is going to be they have to go sell so many things or whatever down to Manhattan or something like that uh, and basically they have to go into a planning phase right uh, and then they actually have to then go out and deliver and part of project management though is once you're delivering you need to control the project so you monitor it you look for any risk that may arise you make sure that your budget is on you know is on point basically that you're within budget uh, you make sure that you're, you're within schedule that you're getting your work done on time and that you're not going outside of the scope you're not adding things that weren't there in the original plan etc there's a term for that called scope creep c-r-e-e-p scope creep where the scope gets out of hand and that ruins many projects so you always want to avoid scope creep if possible uh, and then the last part of it is closure and handoff to the customer again you have a deliverable uh, you have to close the project so again typically it'll have some type of review or inspection or checklist that you go over and say yes this new phone is done or this new car whatever it is whatever the project is this bridge we just built is now totally complete uh, and again then usually there's closing out of contracts if there are any subcontractors that type of thing they get paid uh, everyone's happy customers happy uh, you know any warranties are in place that type of thing and uh, the project then is completed typically project managers or project teams then move on to the next project where, whereas the customer you know has whatever it is they were looking for and it should be known that the customer again can be internal so it could be just within your organization 
or they can be external. You can. There are companies that hire project managers and project teams to come do work for them. Okay, when moving through these five phases, uh, there's two, two different approaches that project managers will take. One is called the waterfall approach, which just means that they're going to wait till the one phase is complete before they start the next phase. So, you know, if we go back a slide here and we say we're at the you know, uh, initiation phase because we're past selection, let's say, but we're at the initiation phase, we kick it off and everything. We're going to wait till all the initiation activities are completed before we start planning for the pro project. Then we're going to plan the entire project uh, before we ever start to do any work to deliver it, etc. So it's called a waterfall approach. It's just one phase happens after the other. Uh, the other choice, and it really depends on, again, the size and complexity, there's not one that's better than the other, but the other choice is called the concurrent approach where the phases actually overlap. So, you know, while we're initiating the project and we're getting it underway, we actually can maybe get a jump on some of the work and people can be doing maybe some pre-work, uh, maybe getting uh, licenses out of the way from the city or permits that type of thing where you know so I'm doing some of the actual work that's going to be done before we're you know before we're totally planned out that type of thing uh, and then you know maybe during while it's running I can do some of the monitoring early and, uh, you know exactly so it just kind of overlaps basically uh, so instead of waiting till one is totally complete before you do the next one everything has an overlapping point uh, that's called the concurrent approach again and again it really depends on you know the type of project but like it says uh, with the concurrent approach the phases overlap there's greater coordination and communication that is required and you know because of that uh, and each phase may individually take longer but the project overall a lot of times take less time uh, and yields a higher quality output but that's not necessarily always true so don't take that kind of as gospel but that's just a general rule uh, but again depending on the project sometimes that waterfall approach is much more appropriate where you have to finish everything before you can start the next thing a lot of times with software that's the way that works uh, you have to have it totally planned out before you start jumping into building it because you don't want to get halfway through and then find out you know, you have to go back to the square one, basically, because there's some programming that needed to be in there from the beginning. So just as an example. Okay, so along with all this other terminology, uh, we actually have a main document called the Project Management Plan, you know, that, that documents all of this stuff that we're going to do to plan out the project. So it's the planning document, captures the entire project from end to end covers all the phases from initiation, planning, execution to um, closure. Uh, so again, monitoring and control is within there. So there's all kinds of little sub plans within the project management plan, like your stakeholders plan, where you're gonna lay out all the different people who have a stake in the project uh, and, and, and address that. You're gonna have human resources, communication, uh, risk management, all kinds of stuff. And actually, I'll go through the specifics of you know each part of the plan coming up. But just know that the project management plan is probably the largest document uh, that you'll have. And this is what we'll be working on in this class, is a project management plan after we develop a small business case for your projects that you're going to make up. You're going to make up a hypothetical project, and then we're going to move through all of these steps. Okay, so the project management plan itself, I won't read all of this stuff, but you can see I'll kind of just go over the highlighted stuff, but you know, it'll start usually with an overview. Why are we doing this project? Period. Um, so it include the primary objectives. Then we'll have the scope again, you know, what exactly is going to be included in this project? Uh, what deliverables are there? Uh, something that is definitely a huge part of that, of Delineating the scope is what's called the WBS or the work breakdown structure. That you will be working on, so just keep that in mind. The work breakdown structure will just list 
basically all of the actual activities that need to be performed to get the work done. So, you know, we talk about it, we plan it, but when we get down to the nitty gritty, the work breakdown structure is going to actually list who needs to do it and what needs to be done by when, etc. Uh, then you also have a schedule in there though, and there's different ways that we do schedules and we may list milestones. Those are major accomplishments as you go along the way. Uh, we'll definitely have a budget in there. Uh, we won't go into quality that much in this class, but we will talk about it. But there, you know, there normally to be a quality management plan. Um, again, the project management team. You would all always, you know, list like roles and responsibilities of your team. Uh, we'll get into that. Moving along the plan, you have a uh, communication plan again how you're going to talk to folks uh, talk to stakeholders talk to team members uh, etc subcontractors whoever you're working with sometimes you have to talk to city officials some uh, it can be all kinds of folks that you need to keep up with and communicate with in several different ways it can be from everything from something informal like email to public you know announcements uh, and everything in between you know weekly meetings that type of thing uh, you would plan for risks, which we'll do some of that in here. Uh, so there's different ways that you can list the risks, figure out how you would respond to them, uh, figure out who would respond to them, that type of thing, how you would decide on how you move forward. Uh, and then to talk about, again, closure, uh, deliverables, handoff, protocol, that type of stuff. Changes along the way. Uh, and then we have at least three what are called baselines which go with those triple constraints again uh, you have a scope baseline a schedule baseline and a budget baseline for any project you know, from the start you have to have some idea of how large or how small it's supposed to be how long it's going to take uh, and then how much it's going to cost and you set that in the beginning so that you know if you're doing well, you know, if you're coming in under budget and say ahead of schedule, or if you're not doing so well when you start getting over budget or getting behind schedule or, you know, going outside of the original scope of the project. So the reason we set those baselines is so that we have something that we can look back at and say, well, this is what we were supposed to do, and here's what we're actually doing. All right, and then the last part of this, and this actually relates to the homework assignment that's due on Sunday, is uh, these are just 10 project success factors that were listed in the book. Of course, there's more depending on, again, the industry and, you know, that type of thing. But uh, I won't read these, but if you, if you look in your book and you look at the exercise, the first exercise, I believe number two, is going to relate to this. Uh, it's going to list these different success factors such as like clear and shared purpose or goals or effective scope management. You know, there's two examples. Uh, but what what the homework, the first part of the homework is going to ask you to do is to think of two projects. And these can be projects from work. Uh, you know, so again, temporary endeavors at work. Maybe you had to manage an event for work or maybe there was some, you know, endeavor where you had to clean out a space or something as a team or you had to revamp some piece of equipment whatever it is uh, you had to install video cameras in an area whatever whatever that temporary endeavor is that was outside of your usual work uh, but what I want you to do is think of two projects so they can be from work or they can be from your personal life but you want something again that may have included a team planning a wedding may have included a team Planning a family reunion may have included a team. So those are examples of temporary endeavors outside of what you're normally doing uh, that, you know, might have a budget, right, a schedule. How big or how small is it? 50 family members or is it 200? Are you, you know, taking over a huge park or, you know, a hotel or, you know, exactly how are you doing it? So what's the scope of it? Uh, but anyway, think of two projects, either from work or your personal life. Uh, one is going to be one that was successful that shared many of these success factors and you would you know mention the ones that 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 apply you know if all of them apply fine if not you know concentrate on the ones that did and then you'll have an unsuccessful project where maybe some of these were missed so the unsuccessful project maybe it was due to poor leadership so 
that would be one of the success factors that was not there or poor attention to planning didn't take the time to plan before you jump into it that type of thing so that's the first part of the assignment uh, the second part of the assignment relates to a movie plot uh, it lists some movies, suggests some movies. It can be any movie plot that you want, but all you're really going to do is relate that movie plot to those phases of the project that I was talking about, like the initiation or the selection, initiation, the you know planning, the implementation, and then the closeout of the project. Uh, you relate the uh, movie plot to that. So the book has further instructions. So if you look on page 23 in your book, it'll give you detailed instructions on how you're supposed to do this. And if you have any questions, just email me, you know, within the classroom. Uh, and then the last part of it is you do a little research on the PMI. Uh, you go to the website. I want you to get familiar with it. Um, by the way, uh, the best time to join the Project Management Institute, if you're interested, is as a student because the cost is a lot less. Uh, and you get all the benefits as a normal member so you'll get a copy of the PMBOK guide for free it's a, it's a PDF version but that book normally is like fifty sixty dollars so it's still a good deal because I think the actual membership might be thirty for the year uh, there's all kind of free books you get free journal access you get to look at all the journals all kinds of information that they provide it's a wealth of information on project management so, um, you know, I don't work for them. I am a certified project management professional, which is one of the certifications that you can get from the PMI. It's actually the highest certification you can get in project management. There are several certifications, so you can look at those as well. Uh, and that'll be part of your homework, too. It tells you to look at the certifications, what's required, number of hours of experience, education, that type of thing. I'll tell you right now, just this class alone will cover you on the education part of it. Uh, but a lot of times people need to build up the experience. You can, you know, have experience over the past eight years. It needs to be uh, over eight years. Uh, and some people may even qualify, you know, now or in the next couple of years. They can go for that certification. Uh, but when you're looking that up, it'll ask you things like, you know, how many countries are they in? That I don't need you to list all of the countries. You can just kind of number them and gloss over some of the information because I don't need everything that's on the website I just want you to you know have the experience of figuring out what the PMI does who they are kinda of what they're about because it's something that applies to you if you want to get in this industry you're gonna work with the PMI one way or the other because most project managers are either involved with them or certified by them or you know take classes with them etc so. So that would be it for this uh, first lecture. This is actually kind of covering part of week two as well. And then uh, in week three, uh, we'll get into further information about the business case. And I'll, I'll kind of explain that before we break off in teams and start working on some uh, projects. All right. Thanks a lot. And I'll see you next time.